so in this one, you guys are going to tell us the seven habits of what you guys feel like are the most effective things you guys have done for your recovery, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get started. <laughs> Seven habits of successful recovery. Um, number one, we put motivation down on the list. Um, and you, you've probably heard Amber talk about the why. Um, so what's driving us to do this? What's driving us to be in recovery? Is it court over our head? Is it mom and dad saying they're not gonna help us financially or finish school? Um, what's the reason behind it? And it better be a good reason because it's tough. Yeah, I feel like um, the why is allowed to evolve as well. Where at first, you know, my why was that my parents were threatening to kick me out of their house. I was gonna be homeless. Um, and that why I got to slowly evolve into being my why being that I like being sober and that my life was better and it was just what I wanted for me. And that became a more sustainable why for long term because now it didn't depend on parents or you know if it was court then what if my court stuff goes away then now what's my why to be sober and if I don't have one am I gonna continue to, to go back and get high? Great points Lucas. <laughs> Next, number two, we have community. Um, you know, community just who we're surrounding ourselves with. Um, is it like-minded people who are also trying to get sober? People we've seen um, in meetings around the therapy center, you know, at IOP. Also, people that have things that we want. Like, obviously, coming out of a life of addiction, I know my life was in shambles. So, what I wanted was. I wanted my life to look like the guy who had the house, who had the wife and kids and a family and had the car, you know, that someone who had their stuff together. And I was after that. So I wanted to surround myself with people like that to give me something to strive for. Yeah. I, and I think that one gets some room to evolve as well, where, you know, at first what I wanted was to be cool and be sober and like feel like I was still fit in with like the social scene. So my first sponsor was like a young guy who's actually younger than me. Um, he was like a young guy with tattoos and had a girlfriend and you know was doing cool stuff and like that was what I wanted and and that's gotten to to change over time where you know what I think is cool and what I want for my life gets to gets to evolve and now I'm looking for you know people who have you know really love their life and are happy and you know have, have a happy marriage and healthy relationships with their family and that's the kind of people that I want to surround myself with so that hopefully they influence me. Awesome. You want to take us away with number three? I believe it's honesty. Take us away with number three, honesty. Um, yeah, honesty was huge for me because I was a uh, pathological liar. I'd lie about anything for any reason, most of the time to get people to like me, um, validation, approval, to fit in, you know, if someone had a story. And I'd do the worst kind of lying. I'd, I'd one-up people's stories with a lie because uh, I just wanted to be the best and have all the attention on me. So it became really important in, in recovery for me to have rigorous honesty, where at first it made me look like a fool when I'd say something and then have to immediately backstep and say, that was a lie. I don't know why I said that. I apologize. And that kind of makes you look like an idiot, but uh, uh, that shame kind of drew, drove me to, to stop lying. So when I think about honesty, um, <clears throat> before I got sober, when I was dishonest, I mean, it, it brought along feelings of shame and guilt, but I had drugs and alcohol to cover that up. I could always mask those feelings. Um, it was, I like to call it a snowball effect. Like I would you know, run into these problems, run into these bad feelings or emotions that I didn't want to deal with, and I would take a drink or a drug, and it was like I was throwing these problems behind me. And I like to picture myself running down a hill, and as I'm throwing these problems behind me, they're like building up a bigger and bigger snowball. And eventually I'm going to get to the bottom of that hill, and that big snowball is going to cr come crashing into me and ultimately that was like my bottom i like to visualize that as my bottom where i was like okay something's got to give i've got to change here um, that's when i put the shovel down but moving on today um it, i can't handle those feelings like i i don't like to have shame and guilt in my life so even if i do catch myself in a lie or tickling the truth as I like to call it sometimes you know I need to confront that right away um, it makes me think of you know being in recovery um, it's important for me to me to share that with people um, if I'm out to the bar you know sometimes I'll go out with friends that do drink even though I don't drink and they're like maybe they don't know my background a, a friend of a friend so they're like hey what do you want to drink and I'm like oh I'm good with water 
And they're like, no, come on, get something. Everybody's drinking, you know, or at a wedding. And I'm like, no, I'm fine with water. And they're like, oh, come on, man. It's like, okay, dude, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and if you give me a drink, I'm going to ruin your night, maybe the rest of your life. So let's just <laughs> cut it right there. Let's not go any further with it. And it's important. I just like to share that with people. And I couldn't imagine like keeping that. I understand that some people do keep that away for like professional reasons. And that's okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But for me personally, I like to be out front in the open with everything. All right, moving on to number four. Number four, accountability. Ooh, uh, that's a big one. I feel like that goes hand in hand with honesty a bit where, you know, I had to find people that were going to not co-sign my BS. And I'd like to surround myself with people who, who would co-sign my, my BS when I was using because it made things comfortable for me. When people would uh, believe my lies, I wanted the easiest marks. Uh, that I could lie and manipulate and it became important and also it's good you know that when you come into recovery it's it's other addicts I was surrounding myself with so you know in the realm of lying I was maybe you know playing in a in a wiffle ball setting and now I was in the majors I was around a bunch of addicts that all lied themselves and and they know how to do it on a, on a professional level. And the reason that was good for me is then they could call it out at me and they would you know, immediately say, that doesn't really sound right, you know, or um, call me out on some of my stuff that I needed to be called out on because that was the only way I was ever gonna look at it. And while it was uncomfortable and difficult in the time to get called out by someone, especially publicly in front of other people, um, it was the, the catalyst for change that I needed to, you know, to really start looking at these things that I, needed to change in my life. Yeah, what I think, think we pretty much covered it for accountability. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. Uh, That's not is there anything else we should say for accountability? How do you create accountability for yourself? Like, how do you go about putting that in place? I think early on, you you know, you do it by, you know, we do it here by like sober link, drug screens, mm -hmm. the family count. You know, we, we put those things in place for people. Yeah. But eventually you have to. Oh God, I know where I'm going with okay. this. Okay. Boom. Um, so I'd say a, a big moment where a lot of accountability came into my life was when I went into like treatment and sober living and you know one of the big rules there was like right when you wake up in the morning you make your bed that's not something I was used to um, and then being held accountable to like make my bed make it to morning meditation do my morning chores um, you know those small things that come with sober living or recovery residences. Um, and if you don't do them, there's typically a consequence or you don't get your keys for the day or your phone for the day. Uh, but that was, it was really good for me to get in the habit of doing those small things to build the, um, build some structure. And it was good to have those people holding me accountable. If they're not going to let me slip on that stuff, they're not going to let me slip on going, sneaking out to take a drink or anything of that nature. So that's all I have on accountability. Okay, next, number five, we've got routine down. Routine. What do you think about routine? I think a lot about routine. Me uh, too, I love routine. Because I function the, at my highest level with routine and structure in my life. I don't like it and I don't like to admit that I do, but I do. And when I'm left to my own devices, I will play video games for 16 hours, not brush my teeth, and not eat regularly or, or uh, bathe or shower. So. I need routine to keep my life together. I, I do well with a job and I feel like it goes such in contrast with my life when I was using that I had no routine, no structure. I was, I was running the show and it was a disaster and a mess and I feel like my brain was constantly in fight or flight because anything could happen at any moment. And I think that my brain finally got to take a chill pill, a natural one, um, in sobriety where now all of a sudden my brain got to kind of relax and it was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. I do it the same thing every day, Monday through Saturday. I go to my job, I get off at this time. I'm gonna go hit a meeting. I'm gonna go meet up with some friends afterwards. There just wasn't as much variation that I had to worry about of what's gonna happen next. And then also did a world of good for my anxiety to have some dependability on my schedule. Yeah, I agree with all of that. To start building that where I can be reliable and dependable to, to people in my life because that was something that I, I could not be depended on um, while I was using is to be on time or to show up at all or that if you told me to do something and I said I was going to do it that I would actually do it. Um, so I think routine and accountability just go hand in hand there. Sick. <laughs> oh. I think we should move along to uh, number six which is uh, spirituality. Yeah. Um, this is a big one for me and I don't want people to get confused. I know that that's Hearing that word could be a turnoff for some people and they automatically connect spirituality with Christianity or Buddhism or, but I'm here to say whatever that looks like, whether it's 
um, whatever approach you have, whether it's smart recovery or a Buddhist approach or a Christian approach or a nature approach, um, it's just very important to have something to get outside of yourself to realize that you were just in control in your active addiction and things weren't working out for you. So maybe let's like remove you from the situation, um, take others' advice, don't be the know-it-all, and have some faith. Have some faith in a different process. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would I would stress on spirituality that, that you didn't cover is just that idea of me not being my own higher power, that I had continuously done everything my own way. I put AA to the side, I put psychiatrists to the side, I put doctors, medication, inpatient treatment. I mean, you name all these like experts in the field who would come into my life and say, hey, you have a problem, I'm a professional, let me give you some pointers, some tips, maybe you can do this. And it was just like, no, 18 year old Lucas knows knows what to do to stop doing drugs and you know, go figure it never worked out. So I finally just had to take my hands off the wheel. Um, and at first it was people in the program of, of uh, 12 step programs that was my higher power. And, my life was better listening to what they had to say than, than what I wanted to do. All right, moving on to number seven, hobbies. Last but not least. Not least. Um, yeah, we have hobbies. You want to start us off with hobbies? Start us off with hobbies. I love hobbies. Hobbies. Hobby lobbies. Um, That's so a cool store. It is a cool store. So hobbies, um, yeah, I, in the beginning of my addiction, I had a lot of things that I loved to do, like playing piano. I played drums and bands. Um, I like to paint occasionally. I like to make music on the computer, like produce songs. And as I got more and more into my addiction, all that stuff fell to the wayside. It just wasn't as fulfilling to me. And when I got sober, it was hard to get right back into those things. Um, I felt like I was disconnected from them. But over time and, and effort, now they're you know some of the things that I cherish the most in my life. I'm fortunate enough to have a piano. It didn't come easily, and I remember that being frustrating when I first got sober. That like all these kind of grand plans of I'm gonna get back into music and join a band and play drums and be a rock star and you know all this stuff. And when it wasn't there for me, it was tough. I mean, even video games were tough for me when I first got sober. That I just wasn't as into them as I was when I was younger. And so just kind of sticking with some of those things to to really let uh let them come back into my life was was important and it's good to have just outlets for for having fun i mean i, I didn't get sober to to have a miserable life i got sober to have a better life and have fun and you know hobbies allow me to do that and share them in community you know david and i we lived in nashville went to waterfalls all the time and we'd go track them down and jump off of them and hike to them and that was like a fun activity that you know, built our relationship as friends while also having fun and You're being sober. So, so scared. scared. So scared. <laughs> so I had to go try new things. Um, it was scary at first, but I had to put myself out there, meet new people, try new things to figure out what do I really enjoy. Um, because... I can tell you, you're not going to stay sober if you're miserable. You're not just going to go away magically. Like you're not just going to work 12 steps and the problem goes away. You have to find replacements. Like you're going to have an addictive personality, but we have to have a better outlet for that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. Like I turned to the gym for a while and I was like, that even got kind of unhealthy for me. I was going multiple times a day. I was lifting weights that were, you know, amounts of weight that were bad for my joints. And then I had to revisit that. So I even took what was a healthy hab habit and kind of turned it unhealthy. I was taking all kinds of like pro-hormones, uh, workout, uh, what's it, creatine, protein, mm -hmm. pre-workout. And that was probably hurting me too, taking all of these different chemicals. So, I, I mean, I still have to revisit these things. <laughs> I think Joey told me that you were like jacked up when he was in training or something like that. Yeah, a so small like Toyota like truck. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a monster. <laughs> we were scared to tell him he was starting to look a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that bad. I was big. I'll show you a picture. It's crazy. Of my, I've got a picture of me holding my niece and my forearms are as big as she is. Oh my gosh. When she was like one. <laughs> okay. So that is our list of seven habits of highly successful recovery. Um, I'd like to hear from you guys in the comments section below, like what would you add to that list? What do you think are some crucial items to have on this list? Because we can make it way more than seven. We got days to talk about this stuff. Despite what it may look like, 
David and Lucas weren't always this put together. And if you want to hear more about the behind the scenes and what it took to get here, make sure you check out each of their personal stories. You can see David's story here, and you can see Lucas's story here. Trust me, it wasn't a smooth or easy journey for either of them.